Chapter Thirteen of At the Earth's Core. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Carpenter. At the Earth's Core by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter Thirteen: The Sly One. The Sagoths were gaining on us rapidly, for once they had sighted us, they had greatly increased their speed. On and on we stumbled up the narrow canyon that Gak had chosen to approach the heights of Sari. On either side rose precipitous cliffs of gorgeous particolored rock, while beneath our feet a thick mountain grass formed a soft and noiseless carpet. Since we had entered the canyon we had had no glimpse of our pursuers, and I was commencing to hope that they had lost our trail and that we would reach the now rapidly nearing cliffs in time to scale them before we should be overtaken. Ahead we neither saw nor heard any sign which might betoken the success of Huja's mission. By now he should have reached the outposts of the Sarians, and we should at least hear the savage cries of the tribesmen as they swarmed to arms in answer to their king's appeal for succor. In another moment the frowning cliffs ahead should be black with primeval warriors, but nothing of the kind happened. As a matter of fact, the sly one had betrayed us. At the moment that we expected to see Sarian spearmen charging to our relief at Huja's back, the craven trader was sneaking around the outskirts of the nearest Sarian village that he might come up from the other side when it was too late to save us, claiming that he had become lost among the mountains. Huja still harbored ill will against me because of the blow I had struck in Diane's protection, and his malevolent spirit was equal to sacrificing us all that he might be revenged upon me. As we drew nearer the barrier cliffs and no sign of rescuing Sarians appeared, Gak became both angry and alarmed. Presently, as the sound of rapidly approaching pursuit fell upon our ears, he called to me over his shoulder that we were lost. A backward glance gave me a glimpse of the first of the Sagoths at the far end of a considerable stretch of canyon through which we had just passed and then a sudden turning shut the ugly creature from my view, but the loud howl of triumphant rage which rose behind us was evidence that the gorilla man had sighted us. Again the canyon veered sharply to the left, but to the right another branch ran on at a lesser deviation from the general direction, so that appeared more like the main canyon than the left-hand branch. The Sagoths were now not over two hundred and fifty yards behind us, and I saw that it was hopeless for us to expect to escape other than by a ruse. There was a bare chance of saving Gak and Perry, and as I reached the branching of the canyon, I took the chance. Pausing there, I waited until the foremost Sagoth hove into sight. Gak and Perry had disappeared around a bend in the left-hand canyon, and as the Sagoth's savage yell announced that he had seen me, I turned and fled up the right-hand branch. My ruse was successful, and the entire party of man-hunters raced headlong after me up one canyon, while Gak bore Perry to safety up the other. Running has never been my particular athletic forte, and now when my very life depended on fleetness of foot, I cannot say that I ran any better than on the occasions when my pitiful base running had called down upon my head the rooter's raucous and reproachful cries of ice wagon and call a cab. The Sagoths were gaining on me rapidly. There was one in particular fleeter than his fellows who was perilously close. The canyon had become a rocky slit, rising roughly at a steep angle toward what seemed to pass between two abutting peaks. What lay beyond I could not even guess, possibly a sheer drop of hundreds of feet into the corresponding valley upon the other side. Could it be that I had plunged into a cul-de-sac? Realizing that now I could not hope to outdistance the Sagoths to the top of the canyon, I had determined to risk all in an attempt to check them temporarily and to this end had unslung my rudely made bow and plucked an arrow from the skin quiver which hung behind my shoulder. As I fitted the shaft with my right hand, I stopped and wheeled toward the gorilla man. In the world of my birth I had never drawn a shaft, but since our escape from Futra I had kept the party supplied with small game by means of my arrows, and so, through necessity, had developed a fair degree of accuracy. During our flight from Futra, I had restrung my bow with a piece of heavy gut taken from a huge tiger which Gak and I had worried and finally dispatched with arrows, spear, and sword. The hard wood of the bow was extremely tough, and this, with the strength and elasticity of my new string, gave me unwanted confidence in my new weapon. Never had I greater need of steady nerves than then, 
Never were my nerves and muscles under better control. I sighted as carefully and deliberately as though at a straw target. The Sagoth had never before seen a bow and arrow, but of a sudden it must have swept over his dull intellect that the thing I held toward him was some sort of engine of destruction, for he too came to a halt, simultaneously swinging his hatchet for a throw. It is one of the many methods in which they employ this weapon, and the accuracy of aim which they achieve, even under the most unfavorable circumstances, is little short of miraculous. My shaft was drawn back its full length, my eye had centered its sharp point upon the left breast of my adversary, and then he launched his hatchet, and I released my arrow. At the instant that our missiles flew, I leaped to one side, but the Sagoth sprang forward to follow up his attack with a spear thrust. I felt the swish of the hatchet as it grazed my head, and at the same instant my shaft pierced the Sagoth's savage heart, and with a single groan he lunged almost at my feet, stone dead. Close behind him were two more, fifty yards, perhaps, but the distance gave me time to snatch up the dead guardsman's shield, for the close call his hatchet had just given me had borne in upon me the urgent need I had for one. Those which I had purloined at Futra we had not been able to bring along, because their size precluded our concealing them within the skins of the Mahars which had brought us safely from the city. With the shield slipped well up on my left arm, I let fly with another arrow, which brought down a second Sagoth, and then as his fellow's hatchet sped toward me, I caught it upon the shield, and fitted another shaft for him, but he did not wait to receive it. Instead he turned and retreated toward the main body of guerrilla men. Evidently he had seen enough of me for the moment. Once more I took up my flight, nor were the Sagoths apparently over-anxious to press their pursuit so closely as before. Unmolested, I reached the top of the canyon where I found a sheer drop of two or three hundred feet to the bottom of a rocky chasm. But on the left a narrow ledge rounded the shoulder of the overhanging cliff. Along this I advanced, and at a sudden turning, a few yards beyond the canyon's end, the path widened, and at my left I saw the opening to a large cave. Before, the ledge continued until it passed from sight about another projecting buttress of the mountain. Here, I felt, I could defy an army, for but a single foeman could advance upon me at a time, nor could he know that I was awaiting him until he came full upon me around the corner of the turn. About me lay scattered stones crumbled from the cliff above. They were of various sizes and shapes, but enough were of handy dimensions for use as ammunition in lieu of my precious arrows. Gathering a number of stones into a little pile beside the mouth of the cave, I waited the advance of the Sagoths. As I stood there, tense and silent, listening for the first faint sound that should announce the approach of my enemies, a slight noise from within the cave's black depths attracted my attention. It might have been produced by the moving of the great body of some huge beast rising from the rock floor of its lair. At almost the same instant, I thought that I caught the scraping of hide sandals upon the ledge beyond the turn. For the next few seconds my attention was considerably divided, and then from the inky blackness at my right I saw two flaming eyes glaring into mine. They were on a level that was over two feet above my head. It is true that the beast who owned them might be standing upon a ledge within the cave, or that it might be rearing up upon its hind legs, but I had seen enough of the monsters of Pellucidar to know that I might be facing some new and frightful titan, whose dimensions and ferocity eclipsed those of any I had seen before. Whatever it was, it was coming slowly toward the entrance of the cave, and now, deep and forbidding, it uttered a low and ominous growl. I waited no longer to dispute possession of the ledge with the thing which owned that voice. The noise had not been loud. I doubt if the Sagoths heard it at all but the suggestion of latent possibilities behind it was such that I knew it would only emanate from a gigantic and ferocious beast. As I backed along the ledge, I soon was past the mouth of the cave where I no longer could see those fearful flaming eyes, but an instant later I caught sight of the fiendish face of a Sagoth as it warily advanced beyond the cliff's turn on the far side of the cave's mouth. As the fellow saw me, he leaped along the ledge in pursuit, and after him came as many of his companions as could crowd upon each other's heels. At the same time the beast emerged from the cave, so that he and the Sagoths came face to face upon that narrow ledge. The thing was an enormous cave bear, rearing its colossal bulk fully eight feet at the shoulder, while from the tip of its nose to the end of its stubby tail it was fully twelve feet in length. 
As it sighted the Sagoths, it emitted a most frightful roar, and with open mouth charged full upon them. With a cry of terror, the foremost gorilla man turned to escape, but behind him he ran full upon his onrushing companions. The horror of the following seconds is indescribable. The Sagoth nearest the cave bear, finding his escape blocked, turned and leaped deliberately into an awful death upon the jagged rocks three hundred feet below. Then those giant jaws reached out and gathered in the next. There was a sickening sound of crushing bones, and the mangled corpse was dropped over the cliff's edge. Nor did the mighty beast even pause in his steady advance along the ledge. Shrieking Sagoths were now leaping madly over the precipice to escape him, and the last I saw he rounded the turn still pursuing the demoralized remnant of the man-hunters. For a long time I could hear the horrid roaring of the brute intermingled with the screams and shrieks of his victims, until finally the awful sounds dwindled and disappeared in the distance. Later I learned from Gak, who had finally come to his tribesmen and returned with a party to rescue me, that the Rith, as it is called, pursued the Sagoths until it had exterminated the entire band. Gak was, of course, positive that I had fallen prey to the terrible creature, which within Pellucidar is truly the king of beasts. Not caring to venture back into the canyon, where I might fall prey either to the cave bear or the Sagoths, I continued on along the ledge, believing that by following around the mountain I could reach the land of Seri from another direction. But I evidently became confused by the twisting and turning of the canyons and gullies, for I did not come to the land of Seri then, nor for a long time thereafter. End of chapter 13